Uh, I'm Josh Human. I'm the Curator of Education and Public Programs at the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery at Harborfront Center. Uh, we are delighted uh, to welcome you for this in conversation uh, between Vincent Misen and David Austin. Um, this past Friday evening, uh, I'm hoping that all of you know the Power Plant. Hello. There you are. Um, I'm hoping that everyone knows that the Power Plant opened uh, our fall 2019 exhibition season uh, with four uh, really amazing uh, exhibitions, Anxious Audience by Rashid Johnson, um, uh, Hold Everything Dear by Hajra Wahid, who joins us uh, today, uh, What We Found After You Left by Naeem Mohamian, uh, and of course, Blues Flair uh, featuring Vincent Neeson's work. Uh, the exhibition by uh, Vincent has been organized uh, and circulated by the Leonard and Vina Ellen Art Gallery at Concordia University uh, with the support of Canada Council for the Arts, uh, as well as the Conseil uh, des Arts uh, et des Lettres de Québec. Um, at the power plant, the exhibition is made possible uh, with supporting donors uh, Jacques Carnier and Lynn Villodeau. Um, and of course, the power plant is incredibly uh, grateful uh, to the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, and the Toronto Arts Council uh, for ongoing funding, um, as well as BMO uh, for supporting our all-year, all-free uh, admission. Uh, we are here in this um, cozy uh, but really delightful uh, space at Soho House, um, so thank you so much to Soho House for hosting us today. Uh, we really, really appreciate that. Um, in addition to conversations like today's, uh, we have additional programming uh, throughout the season, um, really to highlight um, programs that explore in greater detail certain aspects of Vincent's exhibition. Uh, we'll have a lecture performance by Montreal-based poet uh, Kai Kilo uh, coming up in November, um, a screening of Herbert Danska's Right On, a uh, 1970 classic about the last poets. Um, as well as a screening of Ninth Floor, which is a National Film Board of Canada uh, sponsored film uh, about the, uh, the Sir George Williams affair uh, and riot. Uh, so, uh, so please, please uh, check out the powerplant.org for more information about that. Uh, but specifically turning to uh, this evening, uh, when I met with Vincent uh, many months ago uh, to talk about programming uh, in the context of his exhibition, he expressed um, a real desire uh, to be in conversation with David Austin, and lo and behold, David responded positively, so here we are this evening. Um, a bit about the two, uh, David Austin is a Montreal-based educator and writer, uh, and he is among the foremost chroniclers of Pan-Africanism, uh, black Power and West Indian Intellectual and Political History in the Americas. And Vincent lives and works in... <laughs> so that's a big claim. <laughs> I just want to say that I didn't say that. <laughs> we'll say his publishers have, have set that up. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so there you go. You got, got something to live up to. Um, and Vincent lives and works in Brussels, uh, represented Belgium at the 56th Venice Biennale. Uh, recent solo exhibitions include Printemps de Septembre in Toulouse, uh, the Musée National d'Art Moderne at the Centre Georges Pompidou in Paris, uh, Beaux Arts in Brussels, and the Cruz Palais Basel. And his films have screened in museums and film festivals around the globe. Um, so as the conversation goes on, the two will, will chat. I may throw out a prompt or two. Um, and, uh, and then we'll take some questions from the audience as well. So thank you so much for attending, and we welcome the two. So <clears throat> thank you for being here. Uh, and I would like also to thank uh, Gaetan and Justine and all the team from uh, and Josh from um, from the power plant because I have no time to do it so far. This is the first time I have the mic. Normally I get it before. <laughs> so that's the first thing not to forget. Thank you. Uh, it's been a it's really uh, it's been a pleasure to to be here and to 
to put up the show together. I hope you will like it. Um, so it's true what Josh said is that we, I wanted originally to invite already David uh, for the, the, the Montreal uh, iteration of the show and it didn't um, take place. Uh, so I think it's a, good, um, it's a good opportunity to do it here. Uh, because his book, actually, I brought it here, one of his, only one of his books, but that's the only one I have read so far. It's called Fear of a Black Nation. Um, and it was quite important uh, in, my, in, my, um, in my research for, for this show. Uh, maybe I just have a, to tell a, a little word about the show because uh, we will discuss probably uh, a few works of how uh, we connect together. But... Um, I was invited in the in Montreal in this um, art gallery, which is actually uh, part of the Concordia University. And it's only when I was back uh, after uh, having spent one week researching in the archive of the Bibliothèque Nationale, the work of Patrick Straham, a writer and um, French uh, critique who uh, arrived in in the mid 50s in in uh, in British Columbia first, and then who uh, moved to Montreal in 58. Uh, it's only after I was back uh, reading Sean Mills, another historian, that uh, I I learned about what happened in what was before called the Sir George William uh, University, that was incorporated into Concordia later on, and so the name changed. But that was basically I was invited in the space in the university and right next to the building, the building, the, the what's the name of the building again? The, the hall building, where um, a very important occupation took place uh, and ended up as a sort of riot in court cases. But that was maybe the just a way to see it because it's not just, a, I would say, the, the way to put it like that, just seeing like the violence of the of the riots. I, I, we speak about the Sir George William affair or the computer riots, depending on on which per perspective it is, maybe. Uh, it's maybe an issue to discuss this. But uh, so um, in the book by Sean Mills, I, there were a few mentions to another book, and that was David's book that I asked uh, Michelle to buy and, and, and send me as soon as possible and that's where I, I kind of grasp the importance of that movement and what happened then and for me it was impossible not to make something uh, that was related to it and um, and that's why we have a, um, a work that is connected with the occupation within the show and I thought it was in interesting to keep it for Toronto because it's not a Montreal uh, story. It's, it, the implications are huge, not only for Canada, but also for the Caribbean. And that's what I wanted to discuss because uh, David has been researching this for years, so uh, I, I really uh, take advantage of a lot of, of, of his uh, research. And I think it's interesting to mention this because as an artist, uh, um, sometimes you have to dig uh, into, into facts and histories and that, have, that have been completely... Um, forgotten, uh, but sometimes there are, are some historians who've been digging this uh, before and it helps a lot, of course, to, to take the, um, to have the uh, much more precise uh, idea of what happened. But I wanted to, just to, to, to start this discussion by uh, a quote, it's a, it's a translation which is mine, so it's maybe not a really, uh, means maybe my, in my broken English, but it's a quote from, uh, from C.R. James, we will talk a little bit about him also to, uh, tonight. Um, and he said that history is not a sum of fact, but it is a movement, a living thing. History is the relation between and beyond the eras and the periods of time. So I think it's, I wanted to start this to just to raise the issue of, you know, what is, what is history and how also artists can deal with history not as something that is closed and uh, and a collection of facts. And I think that what maybe the first question I would have for you before we enter maybe the um, more the historical uh, events is uh, you you write in the in the introduction of your book that you're not an historian. 
So I wanted to, to ask, because this book is, is just uh, an amazing sum of facts and relationship between people, and we see a constellation, an amazing constellation of, of people coming from uh, a lot of Caribbean countries, but also from Canada, uh, congregating and, and, and creating a, a huge movement. So how, how, why do you say you're not a historian, maybe? And how, what kind of relationship do you have with, with that? Okay, so before I answer that question, I just also want to thank Josh Human, uh, Laura Demers, who's sitting just over there, and also Gaetan, of course, uh, Verna, and everybody else that was involved in just, so, well, having me here and, and having us connected. Um, as uh, Vincent said, this, this exhibition, this installation was mounted in, in Montreal, and I missed it for various reasons, so it's kind of strange, unusual, but interesting that we're doing it here in, uh, here in Toronto. Um, the other thing I want to say is that, so this is going to be an interesting conversation because Vincent is behaving like he's interviewing me, but like, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's supposed to be a conversation, right? And if it's up to me, it's, the focus will be on his exhibition <laughs> and the links that are there between our collective work. So you'll notice some tension at some points, but uh, yeah. And, um, yeah, so having said that, I, I also want to say that, so the Sean Mills that you're referring to is sitting right there in the white shirt. Um, so Hi, Sean. In a way, it's thanks to Sean that we're, we're, we're here. Um, so Sean is a historian, and Sean will swear by that. He will say that that's what I am. And, and I, I, have, I would say that I have a profound appreciation of history, um, but that history for me is about the present. And I think um, if I think about the two historians who were among other things that I have a great deal of respect for, one of them is obviously C.L.R. James, who was much more, he was a historian and then some. Um, the way he wrote history, including his classic book, The Black Jacobins, about the Haitian Revolution, which despite so many books that have been written about the Haitian Revolution in the last 15, 20 years, it's still the classic precisely because he was writing history about the present. He was writing history as a way of posing questions about the prospects and possibilities for social change in the moment that he was writing in the, 19, in the 1930s. In the African continent, uh, as somebody who was involved in Pan-African struggles, in the Caribbean, as somebody who was from Trinidad, and also as a socialist and a Marxist, who was profoundly concerned about social change, regardless of where that may be. So, you know, for me, in writing this book, and the other person I'll mention, who uh, happens to be C.L.R. James's literary executor, and he's a, he's a close friend, and who is tied to this history, is Robert Hill, um, a different kind of historian, but somebody who takes history seriously. But when you speak to Robert Hill about history, you realize you're speaking to a philosopher who understands the dynamic between past, present, and future. So me writing this book was in part about making a statement about the moment that we're in, particularly in Quebec, but generally speaking, and how we can think about questions about the dynamics between race, class, and politics, and beyond. So really, for me, this is how I interpret my own book, and I, I know people read it as history and people read it as other things, is it's really about understanding the dyna dynamics between human beings in a particular home moment and trying to draw lessons or some kind of understanding of that moment for our time. And of course, because it's the 1960s, it's a moment of kind of fervent protest, people imagining possibilities thinking about dramatically changing the world. So in some ways, although some people make the same argument about the interwar period between the First and Second World War, but in some ways, it's an ideal moment to revisit because it's in that moment that questions about race, class, gender, sexuality, all of the kind of pressing issues that the environment, I was just in a place earlier listening to in a a restaurant listening to, uh, they were playing, a live band was playing Marvin Gaye, what's going on, right? I mean, he's talking about the environment, which we think is the most pressing issue of our time, uh, 
he's talking about the Vietnam War too, but he's also talking about the environment among other things, or singing about those things. Like all of these questions were put on the agenda in a way that had not been done so before. So when we revisit that time, we're talking about our time. So that's why for me, history is not just about history and that's the point I want to make. Right? So folks can read this book, I think, and learn something about that moment, but the point is about our moment, actually. But James himself was, uh, was defending a sort of idea of uh, history as uh, something that was in the past future, uh, how do you say in English, past future tense? Uh, he had a special, specific relationship with, with the, this relationship between past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. um, about the future and the present. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's we spoke about it a little bit. Uh, so, what was his uh, his take on that? Because it's it sounds like it's really something we we connect with. Also, if I would speak for myself, it would be also this: what kind of lessons we can learn from that, and uh, but also how we can actualize uh, issues and look from our own perspective. Because I think the difference also. Uh, between this book and probably other books is, we could say also it's a, it's a kind of insider perspective. Yeah. Well, those, yeah, there's a lot to respond there, even including this whole idea of the insider perspective. But, um, you know, James's abiding preoccupation was, was with how do we think about human possibilities? How do people organize themselves for change? So when you read his book on the Haitian Revolution, The Black Jacobins, right? it's part biography of Toussaint Louverture, but it's really about the dynamics and interplay between Toussaint Louverture as the leader, the folks that follow him, the folks that disagree with him, including his nephew, Moise. It's about um, strategy and tactics and diplomacy between him and Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, but he's really trying to think through the human process of social organization and political organization as a way of thinking about how this process may unfold in, in, in his uh, contemporary moment. So when we were speaking about this, I think one of the connections was that um, he also wrote a book called Facing Reality, uh, which was published in 1958. And at the time, he was in correspondence with Cornelius Castadoris, who was part of an organization called Socialism, Socialism or Barbarism based in Paris. And they were coming to some of the same conclusions about this question of political organization. Um, you know, as I'm sure so some we, of you know. So, so basically, they were, the, the conclusion was that what is necessary is a sort of self-organization exactly. outside of the union, the trade union, outside of the political party. Mm -hmm. So there was a faith, a faith into um, the possibilities for for people to to self-organize. And exactly. he would read this mm -hmm. also into Melville, for example. Yeah. But it's, not, it's, it's people, but it's not just any people. It's our so-called ordinary people. So James's abiding preoccupation is also this concern with how so-called ordinary people have the capacity to do the extraordinary, right? And it's a novel way of understanding how history unfolds because as we know, most of history is written about largely great men, right? But James was always looking down below, so to speak. So you take his, 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 his first, his only major work of fiction, Minty Alley, a novel. Right, he's concerned with the so-called barrack yard life with ordinary women and men and, and their kind of customs and had it, ha habit, habits, etiquette, all of these things and, ha and just how they organize themselves within the context of their daily lives and where they are situated. The book Facing Reality is concerned with how workers organize workers councils in Hungary in 1936, right? which, which they organize, organize outside of the official labor movement because they came to the conclusion that the organized labor was constantly, consistently betraying the aspirations of workers. So for him, that was the new model. So in other words, he was making the point that people have the capacity to organize for change outside of official leadership, right? And that's the future of politics. So in almost every book that James wrote, right, that's, he's concerned with the popular. He's concerned with the people down below, so to speak. 
So it comes back also in his Mariners, Renegades, and Castaways, where where he's actually looking at Melville in, on a, on a, on the level of the more the crew instead of the ACAB uh, relationship with the whale is more like the how the people how the crew is possibly organizing itself. Mm -hmm. So it's true that it seems like something that he's been looking uh, a lot to. But also what you mentioned is, is probably something interesting in, in, the, in the framework of the show, because you just mentioned that he was in touch with uh, Cornelius Castoriadis, so a Greek young philosopher, he was 25 at that time, who had set up uh, this group, a uh, research group. And it's something that comes back I would say uh, not directly in the in the archive that I show, but somehow because Guy Debord, who was the founder of the International Situationist, so a group of intellectual artists who had this idea that instead of um, um, the letterist group, he was member before, uh, who were concerned with making the revolution through poetry kind of radicalized this idea that culture has to be used for revolution. And he brought together a lot of people around him, uh, some of them are artists. But he was, for a short time, also a member of that group, Socialismo Barbari. Mm -hmm. They had all, like, you know, nickname because they would be clandestine or s somehow. And it was a, ho a whole question of people inf infiltrating groups or not. I don't, don't really know, but they were in touch and they disagreed somehow. But it shows that there was a contact there also between these people and and the idea of the of the worker council is something that is going to be very important in James' work, right? Yeah. And we can find it afterwards, and we will discuss this maybe how it it moves also to the Caribbean, how this idea is really uh, taken over and made alive. Uh, by in the Caribbean by other people. I think before, I think you need to tell them a bit more about the exhibition. It's unfortunate you can't see images of it because like, the connections that are coming up in this conversation are embedded in your installation. So as much as it's possible without folks actually seeing the images, and I think you have some images too, right? I think it's important but before we, that you tell people a bit about it. And, and I know you're a bit, uh, but yeah, yeah, but yeah, and, and what and what inspired it? I I don't want to enter too much into this micro history of people, you know, connected to others. But it's 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 really I think what we can find in your book is something also we can find in my exhibition and my way of working is at some point you you start connecting people who were in touch with one another who and and it creates sort of a constellation uh, uh, which is somehow imp improbable uh, or, or astonishing in many ways. And um, in Paris in the, in the mid-50s, many things happen, of course. And, and in, in Saint-Germain-des-Prés, you have this, this group of the lettristes, a bunch of poets, some of them from the main character in that story is a, a guy called Izu coming from Romania. And they are somehow really uh, influenced by Dada and by the surrealist, and they want to push poetry a little bit further. But at some point, some of them disagree with this kind of uh, l'art pour l'art, art for art's sake, you know, that it's not really what they want to do. So they kind they, they, they create another group called International Lettriste. So in International Lettriste, you can hear International, which is a direct connection with the idea of the international. Um, and they start publishing, you know, leaflets and pamphlets uh, where they mix poetry and radical politics. They are Marxists, most of them. Um, and this will end up also a few years later. And the main, the main leader in this group, Guy Debord, who, who became a, a very well known, but maybe not so well known because it seems like a lot of people still don't haven't read Debord. But Debord is a uh, one of the most important, f I would say, political philosopher from the from the 60s, and he's going to write a book called La Société du Spectacle, the Spectacle Society, or the Society of Spectacle, in English. Uh, Raoul Van Eghem, who's a Belgian situationist too, uh, is going to write uh, another book, uh, 
that is uh, is also a member of the Situationist International. So they, they, this 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 group is formed in in fifty seven. So we're just really discussing the moment where actually James is in contact with those people in Paris, and they're in contact with 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 the same people. So it's it's interesting because it's something that has not yet really been looked upon uh, in a way. Um, and uh, these people are going to publish a book, a uh, sort of magazine called International Situationist, so um, carrying the same name. And this is going to be uh, uh, sent uh, freely to people. Uh, but in '68, when the riots and uh, look, the occupation of La Sorbonne starts, um, some of them are part of the occupation, and the the students are reading a lot of things. But one of the things that they're reading is this actually theory. So they kind of foreseen also the the thing coming, and the society of spectacle is is a visionary work that speaks a lot about our society also today the, the time we're living in because what is what is attacking in the society of spectacle which which is a quite a cryptic book if you haven't read Hegel and, and Marx it's sometimes hard to go through but yet yeah, there are things that everybody can understand and it, it basically it's like the idea of spectacle is not about only that the spectacle is composed of images you know that but it's really about the social mediation through images and when we think about social media today, um, it's just, you know, sort of uh, completely, it's a vision of that, let's say. Uh, and of course, it's a, it's a critique of capitalism and it's a kind of shift of the concept that, that Marx had used, like the fetish as a sort of main concept is going to be like um, taken back by the bar and instead of the fetish, it becomes a spectacle, which is like the, the concept to which it can kind of explain the world, so it makes system. And those guys were, of course, looking for a unity. You know, they were like connected with Hegel's thought about we have to find a unity, and so the the the, the concept which is going to explain uh, the society we are living in. So, of course, it's kind of um, problematic on many ways, but it's still very interesting to. To read, and one of the guy who is part of that movement is Patrick Staram, who I just mentioned in the beginning, French guy. But the difference with between him and the other is that uh, Staram left his home when he was 15 and survived in Saint Germain des Prés by playing record jazz records. So he would be a DJ today, you know, like, and he was fascinated by jazz culture, by black music, and that's why it's one of the reasons why he decided to. Uh, live uh, to 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 leave uh, France and to escape the war because he was supposed to become a soldier and had a, a Canadian wife also, so he left for British Columbia and ended up in 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 Montreal, becoming one of the main countercultural actors of that, connected to musician, to filmmakers, to poets, to writers, and he brought the theory of the Situationist in Canada. So he's the one who brought it, even we can say in North America, because he published the Bar, he published some other text. So that's these are these are some pictures in the show, and most of the pictures are connected with a sort of theater play, um, uh, a short text where three characters are actually discussing the images that are just next to it. So that's that's the part that is connected to Staram and his role in the, um, in uh, in the creation of a sort of uh, counter-cultural front, uh, so really connected with Marxism, but also with a, the, a, a very strong interest of what was happening with, with the black power and, uh, and uh, the Panthers in, in the US. So that's, that's part of a work, but then, then there's a whole part that I just mentioned also, like how, how it came that um, uh, by reading Sean and, and you, that that I thought, okay, I have to connect with the situation because it's it's all conceptual, you know. But um, I couldn't imagine like uh, doing this show and showing also another work, which is the the video piece with the Afro-American poet Kane uh, performing live. Um, that I wouldn't, you know, uh, have a connection with with the Sir George William affair. But, but the so. So Kane, who he's referring to, is actually the founding member of The Last Poets. 
So for those of you familiar with The Last Poets, um, one of the most important kind of poetic oral recording artists that, I mean, we talk about The Last Poets, you're talking about the foundation, or at least one of the foundations of hip hop. I mean, without a doubt, absolutely. I mean, they were doing rap before it was called rap to, to jazz and blues. Um, so that's another connection in terms of, you know, where this, where this convocation, conversation began you know, before, before today, I mean. Um, because the last poets were very influential on the poet that I write about, Linton Crazy Johnson, who did, in many ways, what Amiria Baraka and the last poets were doing with the jazz blues aesthetic. He sort of did the same thing with the reggae aesthetic. Right? Um, but so well, that's something maybe we can come back to. But I don't know. I mean, Sean is sitting. I'm, I'm not sure if you, heard, if you ever heard of Patrick Saram. Did you know about him? Uh, yeah. You did? Yeah, because I, I, I didn't know anything about him. Um, and so in the exhibition, you make connections between him, well, direct or there's kind of inference that he's connected to folks like uh, Pierre Vallier, who writes the book Negro Blanc d'Amérique, you know, um, um, and French Quebecois nationalism, which of course, you know, and a big part of this, this, this installation is about connections and links. You cannot talk about Pierre Vallier, who's, you know, arguably the, the most important French Quebecois nationalist theoretician who writes uh, Negro Blanc d'Amérique, which had the unfortunate title in, in, in English of the white niggers of, the Amer of America. You cannot speak about him, and I say that right about the title, but I had profound first respect for him as a theorist. I will say that and we can, we can talk more about that in terms of his humanity as a person and his own evolution as a thinker over time. So that book is kind of set in 1968, but he continued to evolve and change. And Sean Mills talks about that in his book, The Empire Within. Um, but you can't talk about Pierre Vallier and the French Quebecois nationalism in the 1960s and 50s without talking about people like Amy Césaire and Franz Fanon. You know, and folks in Quebec were reading these figures in the 1950s and early 60s, long before they were translated into English. Right, so there, so there are these links and connections that kind of come out that come out in your installation that um, that are that kind of converge within the context of Montreal, and then when you add to that, you you, know, you have folks from the Caribbean who are migrating in large numbers to uh, Montreal and Toronto, in auto to a certain extent, in the 1960s, who are reading all of this revolutionary literature. So they are, uh, I'll go back and just show you the picture here because, where is it, where are they? Those are your images. So these folks here, uh, Franklin Harvey, Robert Hill, Alfie Roberts, Tim Hector, these folks basically adopted C.L.R. James as their mentor, brought him to Montreal, where he delivered a series of lectures on, on politics, basically, to a group of five or six people, right, because they were preparing not only to transform the Caribbean, the various countries where they came from, Jamaica, Antigua, Grenada, um, Trinidad. and uh, well, Trinidad in terms of Rosie Douglas, mm -hmm. but um, St. Vincent in terms of Alfie mm -hmm. Roberts, but they were thinking about changing the world, right? And so you think about Caribbean writers and thinkers, right? The word that comes to mind always is audacity. We're talking about a group of people from these tiny specks on the map, these tiny islands, plus Guyana in South America, right? Who had no choice but to look outward. And the world became their oyster in, very little, in a very literal, literal way. So when you think about J.L.R. James in 1932, he moves to England to become a writer, not a fiction writer. And within three years, he becomes the leading figure in the international Trotskyist movement. He's collaborating and working alongside Leon Trotsky, one of the chief architects of the Russian Revolution. He writes this definitive history of the Haitian Revolution right, as a pretext for thinking about social transformation in, yeah, on the African continent, in the Caribbean, and, and internationally. And he's working alongside people like Jomo Kenyatta, Kwame Nkrumah, Namdi Azikiwe, all of these names without which you cannot talk about uh, Amy Ashford Garvey, um, whose house, whose uh, cafe, restaurant served as a kind of salon and a meeting place. You cannot speak about 
African liberation struggle and the African independence movement without these names, right? So James, for me, is this kind of constant polymath, who consummate polymath, who, you know, whether it was through literature, literary criticism, philosophy, history, politics, you know, he was thinking in order to change the world. And these folks here basically adopted him as their mentor. One person that's missing from this picture here is uh, Anne Coos. There was a picture with her and Selma James. Uh, that's, uh, I don't want to begin to describe her as, as C.L.R. James' his wife, but because she was an important feminist theorist and, uh, and also a political organizer in, in the organization that, that she, James, and others were a part of. Right. So, so Anne Coos is part of the story too, which is you know, sometimes an interesting and tricky story to tell because she's very conservative, right? but you can't rewrite the history. And in that moment, she played a profoundly important political role right? um, as a feminist. You know, what happened after and why, that's, I think that's beyond all of us here. Right? But, uh, so she's an important part of that story. And I had here just, uh, which comes back to something that uh, Vincent said. This journal here was put out by uh, members of those group, of that group. Right? And in this journal, Caribbean International Opinion, which is really a kind of Caribbean perspective on the world. There are articles in there about the war in Vietnam, which was an important moment for folks like Tim Hector in correspondence with CLR James, because James was traveling between London and Paris during that moment, observing this revolutionary moment in France as it was unfolding, right? And for him, it was like trying to make sense of this movement, which in so many respects affirmed his politics because France 1968 is often described or dismissively, I think sometimes as a student strike, but it was a general strike. 12 million people. That's, that's you know, that's bigger than most countries, right? many countries, and folks, like 1956, they took over the factories from management. They didn't just strike, they were running the factories themselves, Renault factories and others, right? And it took the army, which was, you know, is one of those kind of revolutionary moments where the army stood back and watched things unfold. And at a certain deci decisive moment, they decided to throw their weight behind the Gaul and the state. That's what ended it, but this was, like literal revolution in every sense of the word. So James was fascinated with that because it was, it was revolution in mo motion. And in post that revolution, they were writing about it and thinking about it in terms of trying to make sense of, well, what does that recent history, they were writing about it in 1960 as it was unfolding and after, what does it tell us about human possibilities despite its failure? Right? So, um, those folks, James, France, 1968. I mean, in that same journal, they're thinking about, they're thinking about, you know, African politics. There's an article in there by, 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 uh, by another figure on, 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 on Haiti and Duvalier, right? So, I think you know, to understand who James was, and to understand who these folks were, you know, for those folks who are not from the Caribbean. It requires suspending everything you think you know about Caribbean people, right? Because I tell my students, you know, the Caribbean probably per capita has produced more intellectuals and writers than most places in the world. That's a reality. You know, we see Haiti, or people see Haiti on television as a place of tragedy, right? But when you go to Haiti, you realize that Haiti is a place of art and culture and literature, right? And it's only when we begin to understand that and, and recognizing that they're like, they're, they're material conditions that produce that, right? When you come from places that have been underdeveloped as a result of slavery and colonialism, right? What people are left with is their creativity, right? And it takes- it, But it it's a very Jamesian uh, mm -hmm. take on it, right? Because that's really what he believed, that the, the oppressed is the most creative. There, I, I want to raise a question mm -hmm. here because you know there's a fascination for the workers' council Mm -hmm. Right, so it's based from the Russian Revolution. It's taken over by, by James, um, and then and then I don't know. Probably it's something that Castoriadis take over, and then Guy Debord, and all the situationists they are into a sort of 
rhetoric with the Workers' Council. But there are like, you know, a bunch of intellectual living in Saint-Germain, drinking a lot and so on. James is someone different. But still, I wonder, you know, the, the situationists was, were disconnected from that reality. Like a lot of bourgeois students, even though they were different than, than the others, I think, uh, much more radical and, and precise about what they wanted and how they wanted to do it. There's a sort of complete phantasmatic relationship to that. I think that what is different is probably the idea of James taken over by these folks and by other people, like the one that I bring in the show called George Myers, uh, slash uh, Fundi and slash his self-proclaimed Caribbean, Caribbean situationist. So it shows also there is a relationship bet bet between the what the situationists have, have put in the world and how it has been translated in many countries and, and, and has traveled to New York and to London and to everywhere. But can you say a bit more about that figure? Because it's not something to talk about in passing. I mean, you know, you're talking about somebody who I've known, in a known about in a different context and had no idea that he was associated with this, any conception of situation okay. this as a movement. So that's, that's, I just tell the story because it's, it's also, it shows how, how organic sometimes I work and, and what it, how things come into movement also, I think. Uh, um, and basically, I, when, I know about the, when I know about the occupation um, of the university uh, in 69... That's in the George you're talking about. Concordia. Serge George William University in, in, in Montreal, 69. Uh, and maybe we have to just say a word about that also so that people who haven't seen the show are not aware about that. So the occupation is, is seen by... by, by by you and by, by Sean and by some other people as a very important moment, of course, of, of the, the emancipation of black people in Canada and elsewhere. Uh, and in many ways, I think we could reconsider also uh, the importance it has, because if we speak about Paris, then we speak about, you know, always the, the number of, of strikes and people, um, like 12 million, so you just can imagine what it means. But there, there in Montreal, it was very different. But the occupation has had an impact, a very important impact, also on how the black population have organized in, in sometimes in magazines, in TV, in social uh, grassroots organization. It's it's incredible to see how, what happened afterwards, as a, as a support, but also as a, as a consciousness of the need of self organization. But but um, when I learn about the occupation. And I, I understood that it, Caribbean people were at the origin of it. I thought about this situation is from the Caribbean that I, I heard about because he had put out a record in 73. So I tried to found a, this LP and, and to bring it in the show, thinking that, that that was also the connection between Staham, the occupation. And when I, when I ordered a leaflet and I found in, a, in Paris a leaflet, there was a map inside. And the map was actually a depiction of all the strikes, rebellions, and uh, insurgent moments in the Caribbean, starting in, I think, 63 up to 75. And in that, on that map, there's a, there's a sort of uh, timeline in which the occupation is mentioned. So it's, it's, it really shows how, at, at that time, I understood that it had an impact in the Caribbean, which I didn't know before reading. And it was understood book. as a Caribbean protest, rebellion, but outside of the Caribbean. Yeah, yeah. But then it had a, a major impact because there were like uh, support groups that were creating. And, uh, and so in this show, I, I bring new pieces. Uh, and one of them is, is from a bank, uh, a paper and a political party that was actually created by, by Robert by, by Robert Hill and others. Abbey. So yeah. mm -hmm. you see, it's, it's, it's just, uh, it shows how something happening in Montreal has a, a huge impact uh, mm -hmm. in the Caribbean also. And so we might con reconsider also the importance of, you know, a student strike mm -hmm. and maybe the Sir George William affair as being much more important than, uh, than, than, than it was even a few years before you two mm. have been writing about that and that the film has been made because it seems like before that it was nearly forgotten or hidden as a, as a sort of a, 
Well, in many, in many ways that is true because I think, um, you know, there's this fascina fascination and romance with the 1960s, which often doesn't do that historical period justice. Um, and these were not just sort of, I mean, these were not hippies, right? These were folks who were pol political beings, right? Who had been thinking about politics quite deeply, right? And then we were engaged in this process, this, occup this occupation. And also, they were students, but like, we have to kind of expand that category of what it means to be a student, because many of them had been adults teaching and working in various parts, in, in various contexts in the Caribbean before they came here. So some of them were mature students, but also what fed and helped to sustain the occupation was not just the students who were actually studying at Sir George, what is now Concordia, but there was an entire community behind it, right? So many of the people that were involved in the occupation were not even students, even though it began with students. It was a, it was a community that was organized, and in many ways they saw what was happening at what is now Concordia as a microcosm of what was happening in the world, right? And then it's important to add because, you know, in large part, I, you know, when I, you know, looking at the installation, the theme, one of the running themes is really about connections, right? And we're, we're kind of in an interesting moment today in which there are various strains of thought that suggests that any notion of human solidarity is an impossibility. Now, I personally don't subscribe to that, although I do agree or I do appreciate the importance of autonomous organizing. Like there are various groups that organize within their communities, but it's the connections that become important after that too. Right? And there was an array of people that were involved in this occupation, even though it was led by these Caribbean folks, right? All kinds of folks, French Quebecois nationalists. You know, during a, an event, there was a series of talks, a, a major conference actually, that was organized at Concordia in February. And it brought together many of the leading, many of the figures who were involved in the occupation who had never spoke publicly because they had been traumatized by the enemy. We were talking about people that had gone to prison, who were beaten by police when they were arrested during the occupation, um, so, and, and folks who became kind of social pariahs because they were involved, right? Some of the folks were from Northern North African woman who had said she had never spoken about this publicly since because it traumatized her so much. You had people like Felipe Fiseme who, who now lives between Montreal and Haiti, and they were pointing to a picture that was a kind of mural on the wall, and there was a photograph of folks who were in the windows of the occupation and identifying people who were involved. Some of the folks who were involved were like people who were members of the FLQ, right? Who had to go into exile, right? In Algeria and Cuba as a result of their involvement in, in Quebec nationalist politics. So it was a particular moment where there was some notion of human possibilities that transcended race. That transcended race. Now I, I'm not suggesting that we can just go beyond race and that's because that, that's just as problematic. I mean, go beyond it in the sense that we, we kind of talk about some abstract universal that doesn't take into consideration people's particular experiences. That doesn't, that doesn't work. But, you know, when you think about, to go back to Pierre Vallier for a second, this is somebody, and, you know, and Sean talks about this in his book, but this is somebody who was kind of grappling with what it meant to, meant to be a French Canadian. He was grappling with what it meant to be a, a kind of a human being, a political being, he was grappling with what it meant to kind of be, you know, be preoccupied with changing the world. And, and, and so even though I don't agree with that kind of appropriation of this, this, this notion of negro blanc, because it kind of sidesteps the, appear, the experience of people like the real neg, like people of African descent, right? It was an attempt to kind of think about the relationship across racial boundaries. Like what does it mean to be a human being and be exploited in whatever form that takes? It may have been a failed, it was a faulty attempt in many respects, but you know, it speaks to a moment where people believe that change was possible. And when we think about the moment that we're in right now, today, um, 
there's a lot that we can think about in relation to that past. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is this where we talk about Trudeau and blackface? No. No. Talk about talk about Negro Blanc. But, uh, but yeah. <laughs> I can tell you a story about Trudeau because it's uh, not the not the son but the father. Uh, because there, it's it's these are minor facts, you know. It's it's not important, but at some point it shows, you know, how history is sometimes really strange. It's the fact that Patrick Staham had a very good friend who was the best friend also of Guy Debord, so part of this letteries group called Ivan Stegloff. Uh, who was a, an incredible poet and visionary who wrote a text which is now considered as the really like the the roots of the situationist in their the poetics of the situationists who were inventing concepts of wandering the city drifting you know uh, different concepts of not concepts also praxis you know things that were connected to their daily life and their, the whole relationship with the, the daily life and the transformation of the daily life um, actually, uh, the first the first one who published Patrick Staram in Montreal is Trudeau's father, and Trudeau's father was going to Paris, and Staram asked him to visit his friend who was in a, actually in an asylum uh, because he had become pretty much mad, and and Trudeau went to visit actually Steglov for Staram, and, and, and right after they had a fight, of course, a political fight, because Staram was completely connected with Parti Pris uh, and with the Marxist uh, trend of the, of the Liberation Front in, uh, in Quebec. It was a, but, a journal, in, in, uh, uh, a left socialist Marxist journal in, mm -hmm. well, Marxist journal in, in Quebec. Yeah. So it's, it's really strange because you see Trudeau's father visiting, you know, on behalf of Staram, someone in Paris in in the 50s. And it doesn't mean anything, but still, there is, these are really weird connections. And see how, how also Staram could connect with a lot of different people uh, within a, a very short uh, moment. Well, um, the person to the right here is Rosie Douglas. To your right is Rosie Douglas. And that's uh, Elder Thibault, who uh, these were the co-chairs of the Congress Black Raiders. Congress of Black Raiders, an event that precipitated, in some respects, the Sir George Williams affair. It took place in Montreal, 1968. Um, but Rosie Douglas, who went to prison, actually, for his involvement, did hard time in prison for his involvement in the Sir George occupation and protest. Um, you know, these are folks that knew Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Right. They moved in the same social circles. It's a very interesting, this is before Trudeau becomes prime minister. Mid 60s, yeah, up until before that, 67, yeah. 65, 64, in that period, they were moving in the same social circles, right? So we have ideas that are being exchanged and circulated. So, I mean, I can't prove this definitively, but when we think about what happens in Sir George and the conversation that took place in Parliament about what to do with these students, and yet folks like Diefenbaker, who, you know, Trudeau is often credited with Canada's immigration policies that allowed a lot of Caribbean folks to enter this country as either students, domestic workers, or whatever the case may be. But it was actually really Diefenbaker. Right? But during Sir George, it's Trudeau that becomes the voice of reason, not Diefenbaker, because Diefenbaker is talking about deporting some of these students, which is kind of uncharacteristic because he was known by porters, black porters working on the train, as one of the few, few people that treated black porters as human beings. So when we think about the conversations that took place in Parliament during that period by all the major politicians, obviously, um, because Sir George was this national and international event that sort of embarrassed Canada, right? but also awoke, you know, awakened Canada to the, to the reality that racism had always, always been here, right? and, and, and sort of sparked conversations about colonialism and Canadian, Canadian imperialism in in the Caribbean in terms of banking, in terms of the bauxite industry, which is used to produce, produce aluminum foil, aluminum, et cetera. Um, you know, multiculturalism as a policy comes out through Trudeau and the liberals, right? And it's hard to believe that, you know, whatever we think about those policies, that it's not at least in some way a reaction or a response 
or in conversation with what happens at Sir George, right? So this becomes official policy, right? And it's also, you know, it also becomes tied to how we understand immigration in this country. But a lot of that goes back to this time. Now, I'm being very speculative here because I haven't done any, I haven't done any research on that. But um, it's an important political moment for so many reasons. But the thing to take away from this, I think, is that there are conversations happening. And folks who we, according to the dominant Canadian narrative, would normally be outside of that conversation, in this case, black and Caribbean folks, they're actually at the center of these conversations. Right? They're actually at the center of these conversations, including, of course, uh, Haitian exiles and intellectuals. And Sean has another book that he's written called A Place in the Sun which is about Haitian exiles in Montreal in the 1960s, 70s, through the 80s. It's a very important book in terms of understanding that political moment and sort of reversing how we appreciate how knowledge and politics is transmitted, right? This is how Haitian self-organization and Haitian intellectuals influencing the conversations, not only in Quebec, but in Canada. So where do we go from here? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. It's almost time to like uh, to turn it over to folks for questions or conversation. We might. Much, yeah, yeah, yeah. How much more time do we, Josh? How much time? How much more time do we have, Josh? For this or for questions too? So I think we should have enough time for a conversation, you know. But maybe there's a way you can. Um. <clears throat> well, maybe we could we could. We could speak a little bit about, uh, now I'm making your promo, but for, for about the new book. Uh, so in, in, the, in, the, in the exhibition, there is this, call, this, book, uh, this, uh, this film called Ultramarine, uh, which is a collaboration I did with Kane the Poet, so one of the founder of the, the original Last Poets in Harlem in May 68 also. So it's not a, it's not a detail here. Um, and... Uh, he lives in the Netherlands, so uh, I think the, the show is really like bringing uh, Staham and, and Kane as two people making some kind of one uh, one one way uh, from from France to Canada and the exiles, other, yeah, exiles, and and one from from New York to to the Netherlands, and who's been living there for more than thirty five years, uh, quite lonely and and forgotten also. Um, so of course I was interested in inviting him to write a new piece, and and we discussed the issue of um, the so-called uh, abstraction of color and blue um, as being um, something very important into the into the history of the movement. Uh, this relationship to to the color, to blue, to the blues, uh, because the work was commissioned first for a city who. Had which has been uh, built in the Middle Ages with uh, the commerce, the commerce of, of blue pigments in the south of France. Which city are you talking about? Toulouse, mm. and which is also the city, one of the main city for troubadours. That's where the first poetic society has been ra uh, created in the 13th century. So these are two elements that really um, brought me to him, and 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 because I was fascinated also by one album he uh, recorded in 70 called Blue Guerrilla. Um, so that's how the, 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 the discussion started, but, uh, but I was also with the idea that I would curate in local museum some, some and choose some objects that I would, would be in the film. So we, we discussed this, I showed him what I would incorporate in the film and created this momentum of a performance with a, a Belgian post-jazz drummer, I would say post-jazz or fusion fusion drummer, very gifted drummer of, who is only 28, um, and and to perform live uh, twice two days without any kind of rehearsal. Um, so that's that's what Ultramarine became in the end. I think there's a there's an attempt to you know bring poetics and politics together and in some way um, it's mediated by uh, the object but of course also by the very personal narrative and poem that Kane has written about his own experience 
Um, and I was wondering about, I haven't, I've ordered the book, but didn't arrive before I left Brussels. Uh, I was wondering whether this is something that comes uh, in, your, in your new book about Linton Quincy Johnson. Uh, this relationship between poetics and politics as, as one of the main, um, probably uh, one of the main uh, um, crossroads. Um. Well, it's strange because I'm going to say something that's going to sound odd, but uh, the book is about Lyndon Quasi Johnson. It's not about him at all. Um, why do I say that? Because I wrote the book thinking about the relationship between politics, poetry, social change. Um, and posing the question like, what is it that poets can tell us about human possibilities? And the poet that came to mind, because I've been familiar with his work for some time, it was of course Linton Quasi Johnson because he almost embodies what it means with, all, with, with some failings and faults, um, what it means to be a political poet. Uh, a political poet who, is politi who was himself politically engaged um, in various organizations and movements, the British Black Panther Party, the Race Today Collective, which is often described in England, this is all in England, uh, as one of the most important black political organizations and newspapers in the UK. But I would take that further and say that given the moment and given the rise of fascism, Thatcherism, and the attack on unions, labor movement, et cetera, it was one of the most important mobilizing organizations with a journal attached to it in England, period. Not just black. And that's important, right? Because James, you know, just to deviate for a second, is all often described, and I had this exchange with this labor historian, socialist labor historian here in Canada, who Sean is smiling, I'm sure, because he knows who he is. Um, where, you know, he, he, he sent me a letter saying something about James being one of the most important black figures and important to the black struggle. Um, and I said to her, well, I said, well, hold on a second. You're, you're not wrong about that. But to leave it there is problematic. James is one of the 20th century's most important thinkers. And that's not just me saying that, right? It's, it's what many people are saying. He was like, the, as I said, the consummate polymath. I mean, you know, it's rare these days that you find people making profound contributions to you know, literature, he was a playwright, he was a theorist, he was a politically involved, he was a historian. A right? sport analyzer. He, he's written a book that's described by many to be the greatest book ever written on sport, on Beyond crickets. the Boundary, which is, about, which is about sport and aesthetics, right? So there's a great deal about art in that book. Yeah, you know? just, just before you, you, mm -hmm. you go on, I was fascinated because he, he considers cricket as a visual art. And why? Because he says it's a representation of movement. Mm -hmm. So he has this kind of take on two sports, which is a, which is not only on the visual but also on the uh, considering cricket as a, as a, as art itself. Absolutely, and high art, right? Right. He, he talks about how you look at you look at style and form of cricket players, right? Great batsmen and even bowlers. Right? It's tell us some. It's telling us something about motion, pace, time, aesthetic, style, form, all of those things. Right? But he's also telling us something about the politics of sport in terms of how it sometimes becomes tied with nationalism and anti-colonial politics, et cetera. Right? I mean, this is somebody who was making profound contributions to our understanding of what it means to be human. So, so, so to make the argument that he's this great, quote unquote, black thinker, well, obviously he was black, is profoundly problematic, which again brings us to Linton Kwesi Johnson. So, you know, there's always this connection between the universal and particular. So Linton Kwesi Johnson begins profoundly influenced by Amy Césaire and surrealism and profound, profoundly influenced by, I use this word profound too much, but very much influenced by Franz Fanon and Franz Fanon's analysis of phenomenology of violence. And he poeticizes those two folks in relation to his experience in the UK as somebody of Jamaican origin, as a Caribbean person, as a writing in, in Jamaican Creole. Yeah, so. exactly, right? So, but it's through writing through that experience, if we're willing to open our eyes, that we learn something about humanity in general, right? Without transcending that experience, right? And it's precisely why 
even though he's often described as this great black poet, he was so important to poetics and the music industry because he's also a recording artist who was on Island Records alongside Bob Marley for many years. Um, he's one of the influential, most influential artists in the UK. And if you go to South Africa, if you go to Japan, you go to Germany and Italy, you find folks who swear by his work, right? So when he's only described as a great black poet, they're doing him a disservice, right? But of course, it's his experience as a black person in the UK that makes his poetry so universal and appealing to people. So, um, but then of course, he's written up poems, eulogies, elegies, sorry, about folks like Walter Rodney. You know, he has these beautiful poems and he's not a religious person that draws on biblical lore as metaphor to talk about the rise and fall of socialism in the former communist state, right? One of them is an elegy for C.L.R. James, actually was one of his mentors. He, uh, C.L.R. James, Lyndon Quady Johnson worked alongside Darkus Howe in the Race Today, Collect Race Today Collective. Darkus Howe is a, a second cousin of C.L.R. James, so there are those, those connections there. But part of what I'm trying to say about Lyndon Quady Johnson, about poets in general, is that and it, and it always comes back to James in this sense. James was an artist, quote unquote, posing as a revolutionary, right? Not literally posing, but if we want to understand why James made these novel contributions to our understanding of politics, it's because he understood politics as a creative process, an artistic process, or at least a process in which the same kind of creativity that is applied to art needs to be applied to politics. So even though he was a Marxist, or described himself as a Marxist, right, James was always stretching the boundaries of that belief system. Right? Because for him, it could not be some kind of dogmatic rendition of what this thing called Marxism is. Right? So he was stretching the boundaries. He was stretching the boundaries of what you know, Hegel, Hegel was trying to tell us about human beings and the absolute. Right? So, and he applied that, that this flexible creative mind to each one of these disciplines, right? To try and tell us something about what it means to be human, right? So Linton Kwesi Johnson as a poet, right? Is engaged in that same creative process, right? Where politics and aesthetics come together. And in many instances, he has been ahead of the curve in terms of telling us about the moment that we're in and the moment that's to come. And, and I'll, I'll just end on this part. For us, sometimes we think artists are almost like prophets, right? That they have this great foresight, but I think it's more insight because they have this capacity to tap into what's already present, but so-called ordinary people, those of us who are not artists that way, we don't see, right? So when what happens in in England, the riots that, well, the rebellion that took place in England in the early 1980s, Linton Kwesi Johnson had been telling folks in England, across England, he'd been telling folks, you know, for some years that this was coming, that the weight of Babylonian oppression, as he would describe it, you know, was just too heavy and folks were going to explode, right? That's his own poetic foresight, also drawing on kind of Fanonian phenomenology and, and Amy Césaire, right? But, um, it's really insight, right? And that's the kind of creative capacity of artists. And Linton Crazy Johnson does it in his own way. He was drawing on folks like Amiri Baraka who were doing it in their own way too. I mentioned Amy Cesare, Kamal Brathwaite, even uh, Derek Walcott. The last poets extent, also. Mm. And absolutely the last mm. poets. In fact, the last poets in some respects were the model because they were doing in the, in the kind of African, in American, African-American context with jazz and blues, as I said, what he then turned to do with the reggae aesthetic. Thank you. <laughs> we've, been, we've been quite long already, but um, maybe there are some questions. questions Shosh? Yeah, any, any questions from anyone? Hi, my name is Josephine, thank you. Um, I don't know if this is a linguistic technicality, but the way that I see it is 
if we look at the Haitian Revolution, and even after the revolution, if we look at the Haitian Constitution, which is one of the most humanist constitution that you can think about, um, to me, saying <coughs> that an artist is specifically like a black poet or a black revolutionary is not so much a disservice because there's some, something inherently humane about being black if you look at revolutions, if you look at the way that black people think of communal gatherings and international gatherings, that is the most humane lesson in history. Um, I don't know if you, if we're thinking about even Toussaint Louverture and all of his problematic um, political moves, if we can say that in like this current global failure of political systems if we're looking at Haiti in the past like week basically and the shutdown there and uh, Canada and you know Americas how do you have a historical appraisal of all of these very important historical figures but still without looking at um, you know a romanticized uh, historical approach to these movements and like really critically look at what about the way that history is written or the way that you look at these figures has made it that right now we are in one of the most scary and failing <laughs> historical moments of time if we're looking at like the conflation of, of, of like or a non-linear look of, of history. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank, thank you for the question. And, um, so for me, I think there are two ways in which people talk about what it means to be black. When black folks talk about what it means to be black, it means something different from when somebody from the outside, in this, and I don't mean everybody from there, but in this case, the person I was referring to, this, this, this historian, um, it was almost like the combination of enigma and stigma attached to the way he was talking about blackness, right? It was almost like a reduction, right? So when black folks talk about themselves, we don't talk about ourselves that way. But it had this, it had a different tone and meaning in what he was saying. And I've seen it in many, you know, in many different contexts, right? So I was kind of just calling him on it immediately. Um, you know, so James wrote The Black Jacobins in 1938. And I've now come to understand that the book that's published in 1967 is a version of the original. Because there were a number of changes that were made, significant enough that it's the same book, but in some respects, a slightly different book. Um, and in 1970, he gave a series of lectures where he talks about how he would rewrite that book. Right? So he struggles with Toussaint Louverture, right? because there are, so Toussaint Louverture leads the Haitian Revolution to a certain point, but then he reaches his own limitations. And his limitations are tied to the fact that he's a Creole leader, he has a narrow conception of freedom, whereas the almost 60 something percent of other Africans, literally, were born and raised in Africa, and they had a different conception of freedom and came from a different civilization. Right? So James doesn't really tackle that in the book, but in these lectures he says, if I had to rewrite the book, he would make more reference to the unnamed leaders who sustained the revolution when folks like Toussaint Louverture, Christophe, even Dessalines to a certain extent were willing to compromise with the French. Right? So, yeah, I think that there are elements of romance, but he's also, there's also a critique of Toussaint Louverture in the book too, and he's struggling with that, right? Because on the one hand, he embodies, you know, this kind of modern organized leader. But of course, what we know now is that most of the, 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 the former slaves who participated in the Haitian Revolution were African born. Many of them were soldiers, not warriors, but soldiers from the Congo, right? Who brought their military technology, not to mention civil, their, their own cosmology and understanding of the world, to Haiti, right? And that's not something that James really addresses in the book, right? And, but subsequent writers, including one of his students, uh, Carolyn Thick, who taught at Concordia for many years, has talked about that. Just one other thing I want to say, because you raise an important point. 
about the Haitian Revolution, which is tied to uh, actually this question of, you know, you know how this notion of black becomes a limitation when it's when it's when it's when it's kind of uttered by some folks. Um, but James James himself would would say that he doesn't know what it means black studies. There's only one one history that okay. he says is human history. Let, let me so is that not the other part of the? Well, let, let me come to that point in a second, right? Because that is true, and you know. Well, I'll come back to the point. Let me just come back to it because you raised an interesting question. What I want to say is that the Haitian Revolution was in advance, well, went further than the French Revolution, right? Because the culmination of the French Revolution was Napoleon Bonaparte reinstalled, reinstating slavery, right? That was his, his, that was his ultimate objective at the end. Right now, you can talk about how he betrayed the revolution himself. That's a whole other the French Revolution. That's a whole other conversation, right? Whereas everybody was emancipated in Haiti, right? Now, yeah, you raise a point about James and Black Studies, and I, I got to tell you something because I'm actually writing a book about C.L.R. James right now, and I've been sort of walking with C.L.R. James for like 30 years since I was a high school student here in Toronto, actually, and. I fought with him, I've argued with him. I even discarded him for a while, a very brief moment, right? Because I felt as though we had become so close that there was a certain point where I couldn't distinguish my own thoughts from his, right? And so right now I'm going back to him, right? And I can respectfully disagree with him on something. So James was, and, and actually this is not necessarily a disagreement, James was making a point which is actually, I think, the point I'm making, that he wasn't opposed to black studies per se, but he was opposed to black studies as a discipline being reduced to black studies, right? As if it was some special category of humanity did not, that did not play a role. You know, in other words, like we think about the history of the United States and Canada, but we talk about the United States more specifically in terms of numbers, right? the role that African Americans have played in American history has been central, right? It's not something that can be studied in isolation, right? That's what he meant, right? But, and, that's, and that's what he meant, right? So it doesn't mean that black studies is not, particularly within the context where black stu the study of black folks or the history of black folks within the US context and the Canadian context has been dismissed completely, right? But he was saying that it's what it, was, it made a uh, it was a component part, and a, in many respects, a central part of that history. It just that it had been neglected. Right. Yeah, and then the, the Marxist uh, reading is is more important than the for him probably. Also, what do you mean? But say, <laughs> is, I think you're saying. No, I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not. But I think that's what he what he wrote about the the, the fact that the the grid, the Marxist grid, is 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 something uh, that the class issue is more important for him. No. But yes and no. Because Maybe like, I so, come with... No, but yes, you're, you're right. You know, and it depends. You know, this is the other thing that you have to understand about James. He was born in 1901 and he died in 1989. So, you know, you know, James was not incapable of saying something and making a claim and then revisiting it, right? So in 1938, he says, the race in the Black Jack evidence, he says the race question is subsidiary, subsidiary to the class question but to neglect the race question, you know, and he was on to say this almost as grave as to make it incidental, right? So he's making a point that, um, yes, as a Marxist, that class in many respects for him was more important than race, but the thing to understand when he's saying that is that the people that he's describing as racialized people, African slaves, right? They're slaves, that's a, that's, that's a class category. In other words, Race and class are component parts of each other, embodied in people of African descent, because it, you know, being racialized affects how people live and exist in terms of class in any given society. So there's not an absolute contradiction. Mm -hmm. there. It's, it's a complication. Mm -hmm. I get it. Mm -hmm. Any other? We're freezing. We're freezing. We're freezing. It's amazing. Well, Hajra here looks like she's uh, <laughs> she, 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 she's shaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
sites. Uh, I just wanted to um, thank you both for talking, uh, for your talk, and then I also uh, have been trying to figure this out for a little bit, but could you possibly speak a little bit about how these kind of concepts and ideas around the ways in which particular thoughts and political thoughts and ideas come to Canada, how does all of this conversation inform or what's its relationship to the actual incident that took place that prompted the riot and then kind of more ground level discussions around you know the everyday racism that actually sparked the whole thing in the first place so kind of bringing it back from the more theoretical to the everyday of it all mm -hmm. okay um, mm -hmm. no, I think that's that's an important thank you for the question it's an important question I mean so the four folks Plus, and cools. Yeah. Yeah. Poor thing. No, no, it's all good. Yeah. So those four folks plus Anne Cools, who you know, it, we don't have a picture of her, unfortunately, but um, she was actively involved in those things. And there were other folks, other women included, who were involved. Um, in fact, I want to mention one person because it's tied to your question. It's tied to something you said. So Brenda Paris is the cousin of Juanita Westmoreland. Juanita Westmoreland, former judge, uh, from a prominent black Canadian family, so to speak, who was born and raised in Montreal. She was studying at the Sorbonne, finishing her PhD in law in 1968. Brenda Paris, her cousin, went to visit her in France as these events in Paris were unfolding. Right, so she was not the Congress of Black Writers, and she was, as far as I remember, she was still in Paris during the Sir George Williams protest. <coughs> that moment for her was part of her political awakening. Right? She saw all these folks in the street, right? and yes, this was France, but the thing to understand, and, and Christian Ross talks about this in her book, we were talking about this the other day, May 1968 and, the, and its afterlives, you know, the Algerian liberation struggle played a prominent role in what was happening in France in 1960 in terms of how people were inspired. So did the ideas of France Fanon. Um, so Brenda Paris comes back to Montreal and gets actively politically involved. She becomes part of the African Liberation Support Committee. I just discovered this document where she, there's a minutes of, minutes of a meeting that took place, uh, I think it's in South Carolina. This was a committee that raised funds for liberation movements across the African continent. And she actually left with those funds that were raised. And she was in Guinea-Bissau during the time of Amica Cabral in Tanzania and other places. This is a black Canadian woman who was born and raised in Montreal. Her cousin, Juanita, leaves Paris to represent the students at Sir George. She becomes their lawyer. Right. Um, so I'm making a point that, you know, there were these practical steps and points of convergence that contributed to what happened at Sir George and contributed to what the aftermath of Sir George. Right. But before Sir George, those folks that I mentioned, including Anne Cools, because Anne Cools went to prison, and this is one of the reasons why we can't forget about her, despite, and I, and I don't know if you know who Anne Cools was. Anne Cools was up until recently a senator, the first black senator in Canada, right? She's from Barbados, from a prominent Bayesian family. She was involved in the Carib that, that group that I mentioned, the Caribbean Conference Committee and the CLR James Study Circle. She was the only or one of the few women that were a part of that intellectual political circle. She was in England during the Congress of Black Writers, as far as I know, but came back and was involved in the Sir George Williams affair. She was arrested and went to prison. And my understanding of the person that went into prison from people I've interviewed and talked to, the person that came out of prison after was not the same person. And yet this is the same person that, as far as we know, set up one of, if not the first, women's shelters in all of Canada. Right? So people sort of respond to her in her current 
state of mind where she says some, quite frankly, very ridiculous and unfortunate things around gender, around you know about the, the, you know the, the the conventional family and 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 homophobic statements. Right, that is absolutely true, and she and you know, that that has to be absolutely criticized. But she played a very important political role during that period, and she went to period she went to prison and suffered for it. What I was trying to say, which again goes back to this question of political organizing, is that they were part of a political group that were thinking about, in more, in more theoretical ways, how social change comes about. Right? And then Sir George happens, and it's live. It's concrete. And then you know, they're involved in this process. Well, how do you organize this occupation? You know, and there were all these things that sort of came up along the way where they, so for example, one of the things that Alfie Roberts identified as somebody who was involved, but then was also kind of thinking in political terms about what Sir George meant. He said, you know, here you have these professors who, just by virtue of being professors, exercise authority over students. And then the students take over the computer center on the ninth floor of the hall building, and to get into that building, they have to defer to the students and show their identification. In other words, things were turned on their heads, right? Then they had to think about how do you manage and keep in pristine order this computer center? And you have all of these people coming in and out. You don't know who these folks are. Some of them could be agents. Some of them could be, you don't know, provocateurs, whatever the case may be, right? So in other words, what was happening in that computer center became a microcosm of how you think about an experiment, so to speak, with politics. And, um, you know, at a certain point, they found and they were at a political impasse. They've occupied the center. They've gained national and international attention. But are they going to stay there forever? What do you do at a certain point? And unfortunately, what happened was they thought they had an agreement. They thought they had an agreement with the institution. So people left. People went home. They were cleaning up the center. And that's when the, the, the riot squad came in, when the police. Right? So they, 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 they took over the center. I mean, you speak to folks that were involved who were arrested, they will tell you that they were beaten and battered by the police. Um, Rosie Douglas uh, believes that in the case of, uh, what is her name? And it was a, a, a young woman at the time who was involved in the occupation. She said something to one of the police officers and he cracked her on the head with his baton. And she died of a brain aneurysm a year after. And he believes that it was that crack to the head that, that, that killed her. So, you know, it began with theory in a sense, right? And the Congress of Black Writers was an important part of that because these students had raised their complaint in April of 1968. And the, the university dismissed it. The summer came in and everybody thought it was forgotten about. But then when you have the Congress of Black Writers, all these figures like Stokely Carmichael, Harry Edwards, C.L.R. James, Walter Rodney, Mary McKeever is present, uh, Joan Jones from Nova Scotia, all part of participating in these conversations, James Foreman. These students said, well, how can we be engaged in this conversation about black power, et cetera? And then there's this professor right, and this institution that has cho to, chosen to ignore our complaint and we just let it go. Right? So it quickly shifted from or there was, I wouldn't say shifted, there was this kind of interplay between theory and practice, and there was this constant back and forth. Right? And it's not that everybody was going through that process, but you had some within that group that were thinking about the occupation in relation to what they were studying and thinking about, right? and the two fed each other. I mean, that's the best way I think I can, I don't know if that answers your question. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The other part of it was more about trying to ground it literally in, in the day-to-day -day experience that mm -hmm. set off it. So mm -hmm. more specifically talking about a okay, number so, yeah. of mm -hmm. black students mm -hmm. who were discriminated by their professor, discrim yeah. discriminated against by their professors, mm -hmm. which in turn turned yeah. into this kind of group organization and then filtered into the student body. And, and being discriminated in the wider society too, in, their yes. day, in terms of their day-to-day -day experience, yes. in terms of police, in terms of like looking for apartments and they will be, they, they, you know, you have plenty of folks who call, who would say that they would call to, you know, a uh, potential, um, they were looking to rent an apartment and when they were called, the apartment was available. Yeah. They would show up with their black face and it was no longer available. Right. And then they would send somebody else, one of their white friends, 
and all of a sudden it was available again. Yeah. Right, so there was, a, you're right, there were the experiences both inside and outside of the university. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, it just is kind of helping to ground the theory that you were talking about before, mm -hmm. just to kind of uh, perhaps open it up and illustrate that this kind of, these things that we all experience as black people actually can lead to the bigger collective organization that you're speaking to. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, it has in large part also to do with how the wider society understood who these Caribbean and black people were. So black folks in Montreal live largely behind the tracks, as we say in Montreal, or below the tracks, right? It's in places like St. Henry, Poi St. Charles, Little Burgundy. And it's like you're talking about a few minutes away from the downtown core. But yet they were basically invisible, or as I say, unvisible, because you can't not see black folks, right? But unvisible implies a lack of recognition. It's almost as if you were not present. So much so that Pierre Vallier, writing in 1968, says, well, Quebec doesn't have a black problem like the United States, right? And it's precisely that year that the Congress of Black Writers happens. It's precisely that year that Sir George begins, right? So there was an accumulation of abuse. And local black folks have been built a variety of institutions, right, to kind of humanize their existence in Montreal. So the Colored Women's Club, built, established in 1905, was one of those groups. Uh, the UNIA, Montreal still has one of the oldest chapters of Marcus Garvey's organization. Um, and in fact, the person that ran it for many years as the president, who died in the 1990s, Henry Langdon, was a cousin to Louise Langdon, Malcolm X's mother. And Louise Langdon, Norton Langdon, was an active member of the UNA in Montreal. She was married in Montreal. This is Malcolm X's Grenadian mother. Right? So in response to the racism and the experiences that you're describing, there were these institutions that were built in the first quarter, first half of the 20th century. Um, what happens, though, is that the community is renewed, at least this is the way I choose to see it, by the large numbers of people that come from the Caribbean as domestic workers, women, and students, women and men, and some who came to work on the trains as porters. And they're coming from a context in which there are anti-colonial movements or nationalist struggles taking place. And with all the faults of being in a colonial territory, they've never experienced this kind of racial exclusion. Right? So their response to it is their response to it is not better or worse, but different within the context of the 1960s, right? And um, uh, that's part of what sparks Sir George, but it does not happen without that long-standing black community that had been there too, of which Brenda Paris, who I mentioned, was part of, George Juanita Westmoreland was, these are folks who are born, you know, they're born in Montreal. Montreal is the only home that they know, even if some of them, their parents were from the Caribbean although many black Montrealers, uh, their, their parents are, or grandparents are from Nova Scotia also, which is a, you know, whole nother, um, that's a whole other story. So, so George was a community event that happened in that institution, but it wasn't just a student event, and it was a direct response, not just to Perry Anderson, I think this is what you're suggesting to, it was a direct response, not just to Perry Anderson, this professor, who was accused of racism, but it was a direct response to racial exclusion within the Canadian context, and particularly in Montreal. Mm -hmm. Well, I still sort of feel like we're just scratching the surface. Um, there is uh, so much material here. Um, and of course, uh, I encourage everyone who is here uh, to please come to the power plant if you have not already seen uh, Vincent's exhibition. Um, to really delve into that. And of course, uh, David Austin, uh, an author, we are very pleased uh, to have three different publications uh, by David in our bookstore. Um, so if you get a chance, come on down, see the exhibition, um, get more familiar with what David has written on the, the Black Congress and uh, the Sir George Williams affair and so on. Um, thank you again to Soho House, uh, and thank you so much uh, to everyone who's here uh, for participating in this program. Have a good evening.